Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to uh, start the meeting in just about uh, a minute or so, so if you could please take your seats. Um, wow, that was quiet. <laughs> See, that's what my wife does to me. Um, the first order of business today is to uh, open up this meeting uh, as a Gunstock Area Commissioner's meeting. So I would uh, ask one of the commissioners if they make a motion to open up the meeting. So moved. And if there's a second. Second. You want a second? Second. second. <laughs> there's a motion to open up the meeting in a second. Uh, I don't believe there's any discussion. So I'll declare the meeting open today. Um, first order of business before we begin is I would just like to recognize the, the Gunstock commissioners sitting at the front table here. My name is Brian Gallagher. I'm one of the five commissioners. Uh, the gentleman next to me in the red shirt is Gary Kadash. The gentleman next to Gary is a, uh, a Rusty McClear. And the young lady on the far end there, our newest commissioner is Jane, uh, Jade Wood. Uh, the fifth commissioner is Peter Ness, and I certainly hope he'll be joining us shortly. It's a custom for the commission to begin each meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. And today, I've asked a special guest, Senator Bob Guida, if he would come forward and lead this delegation in the Pledge of Allegiance. So please stand. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I'd just like to take a minute to just to um, recognize a few folks that uh, ha have joined us today. Um, your representative here in Guilford, the Senator, Senator Harold French is here with us today. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner Hunter Taylor from the Belknap County Commissioners, <laughs> Chairman Peter Spanos from the Belknap County Commissioners. I've seen uh, several of your state representatives um, in the uh, audience here today and certainly a lot of other faces that uh, uh, have been part of the Gunstock uh, tradition for a long time. There is one person though that I would like to uh, just uh, highlight um, and that's a gentleman who had been sort of at the steering wheel of Gunstock Mountain Resort for many, many years, um, Mr. Greg Goddard. And Greg has joined us today. And what I'd like to say is that uh, his fingerprints can be found on this site. Uh, Greg is responsible for many of the uh, infrastructure improvements. He's basically has set the foundation um, in his past work for about what we're going to discuss today. So Greg, thank you for joining us. Uh, couple procedural things I'd just like to point out, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to have several speakers in sequential order. What you're going to learn about is going to be on the screen up here. I would ask that if you could kindly um, hold off your questions to the end of the meeting. Certainly, uh, we will take time for questions and answers and comments, and I suspect that there will be some questions that you might be asking that will be answered here. Um, one little final thing I'd just like to share with you uh, why this day is so important. Um, I got up early this morning and I started reading a book that uh, um, came into our house this week. Uh, the author is a gentleman by the name of Matthew Kelly. Some of you folks may know uh, Mr. Kelly. And the book is about the art of generosity. It got me thinking about what does that all mean and, and what does it have to do with today? Well, I like to make a, an equation and sort of a plant a seed in your head about it. Gunstock is a place that equals generosity. Generosity is giving. So you may wonder, what is he talking about? Well, what he's talking about is that Gunstock 
provides employment for many people in this county in, in Gunstock helps families enjoy their experiences, enjoy the outside, enjoy the hiking, the skiing, and the trails. Gunstock is generosity because it provides an escape from our hectic, crazy world where so many things go on that we need a area to be peaceful and calming. Gunstock Believe it or not, and I believe it, and I believe the commissioners do, Gunstock is an economic engine that propels small businesses, it helps families, and it doesn't just contain itself within the borders of Belknap County. Gunstock has a ripple effect which goes throughout our state. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today to share with you the vision of why Gunstock, the treasure, can be a place that will be sustainable for generations to come. So I'd like you to just keep that thought in mind and our first speaker and a friend of mine, Vice Chairman Gary Kadash, will unwrap the box and show us where we're heading. Thank you, Brian. I'd like to put an exclamation point on your comment about Greg Goddard. Uh, we all stand on others' shoulders. And this building was built many, almost 100 years ago, and we're standing on other people's shoulders. And Greg, I want to thank you for the last 20 years of keeping this on track and letting us stand on your shoulders as a platform to go forward. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, if there If there's one thing that I've learned in 40 years of running corporations and businesses is that every organization and enterprise must have a very clear vision of what its purpose and goals are. If that's not in place, and if it's not reasonable, appropriate, feasible, or obtainable and sustainable, then it will fail. And the last most important point as it pertains to this, this facility is it needs to be sustainable. And that's what this plan is all about, because we were challenged to put together a plan that would be reasonable, you're going to find it to be reasonable, I hope, that it's appropriate, that we're not going to put motels and hotels up and down and, and burger joints up and down the entrance to Guns, Gunstock Mountain Resort. When you turn off Route 11, I, th I hope you all appreciate it as I do. I feel like I've moved into a quiet zone, a comfort zone. This is my home. This isn't a typical ski area. I've been in the ski business my entire life. I think I've, I've skied in every ski, ski area. And I've skied in every continent uh, around the world in ski areas, and this one is unique. And how many of you here have been impacted by the Belknap Ski Club? Raise your hand. I think we all have been impacted by the ski club, and I'm, I'm not sure that all of you understand what ski clubs did in the early days of skiing. Before there were lifts and before there were ski trails in New Hampshire, ski clubs were organized to cut trails and people hiked up them and skied down them. Penny, I know you and I raced on, on Tecumseh Trail and ran up that hill every spring. And Heidi, you did the same thing, hiked up at the, the course was the trees on the edge of the trail because there was no lift there. And this was, only, this was in the 60s, so it wasn't that long ago. But in 1918, the Winnipesaukee, Winnipesaukee Ski Club was formed with the ideal to promote skiing in Belknap County. And was that a reasonable, appropriate, feasible, and obtainable goal? Yes, it was, because skiing was growing rapidly in Europe, in Switzerland, and in the Nordics. And in 1934, the Winnipesaukee Ski Club built a ski toe. And that ski toe was built on the west side of the mountain out of Guilford Village and summiting near to the top of where Flintlock starts to come down the grade. Was that, was that feasible? Yes, because it got done. In fact, if you're on Schoolhouse Hill Road, the next time you come down Schoolhouse Hill Road this time of year, take a moment and look up at that, and you'll see the trees that have grown in, the hardwoods that have grown in, where the original trails were. And was it sustainable? Unfortunately, no. It was not sustainable. And it only survived two years because in 1936 and 37, amid the aftermath of the 29 stock market crash, 
Belknap County state representatives and New Hampshire congressional delegation persuaded the federal government to finance construction of Belknap Mountain Recreation Area. This was undertaken by the Works Program and Administration, similar to the Silvia, Civilian Conservation Corps that built Stowe Mountain Resort. In fact, what's interesting, the Civilian Conservation Corps built the same thing there. They built a beautiful lodge like this here. They built a campground at, immediately adjacent to the lodge, and they built a ski lift. Um, so enter a bigger entity with better lifts and the, the sustainability of the Winnipesaukee Ski Club rope tow no longer was viable, and that went away. And that's some of the things that we have to talk about today, and I hope you'll see, see by the end of the day. In 19, then, and at, at, then at, at, at that time, until 1959, it was run, uh, run with, uh, with great success, and there was a, 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 an enabling act where the state of New Hampshire gifted the county of Belknap the resort. And with that, the Enabling Act was formed the Gunstock Area Commissioners to run the operation. The commissioners consist of five business people that lived within the county, and they had authority to run the business, to control the finances and, and budgets. And that has worked. Whoops, I'm sorry, I, I did that. <laughs> um, that has worked very well for 60 years. But recently, in a few, back in two, 2016, there became some friction between the area and the delegation and where money would be, be sent and who got money for the operations. And in 2018, shortly after I joined the commission, there was a, a study committee put together of four county dele delegates, the chairman, the vice chairman who's with us today, Charlie St. Clair, who I think you most all know, and, and John Plummer. Uh, myself and Steve Nix, who was on the commission at that time, and one representative from the mountain. And we were charged with, do we sell the resort? Do we lease the resort? Or do we operate it by the county? And after several meetings, we unanimously agreed Remember, this was three years ago. We unanimously agreed we would not sell it, and maybe we couldn't sell it, so it wasn't an issue at all, but we would not lease it because we would lose control, control that we have maintained now for 85 years and maintained a special product, but that we would run it as it was provided for in the 1959 Enabling Act, and that is that the GAC, the Gunstock Area Commissioners, would run it um, as they have. With that, the only issue that needed to be resolved is how did Gunstock Mountain Resort pay the county for the privilege of running this, this facility? Legislation was drafted by the delegation, members that were part of that meeting. It was brought to Concord, it was approved and put into place, and we today have a very simple formula. We pay 1.75% of every single revenue dollar that comes in. There's no way to change it. The first 1.75% that comes through every one of our cash registers goes straight to the county. Not immediately, but at the end of the year, we accrue for it. So th then we move forward to, I, I'm sorry, I keep on getting, um, I'm gonna get spanked here. I'm gonna be off of the here soon. We move forward to 2122, and here we are today. With, with that understanding, we had a great big green light for the, Gunstock Area Commission and Gunstock Mountain Resort to move forward and put in place a plan that was reasonable, that was feasible, that was sustainable, and most importantly, captured the full potential of what this could be. Something that I've always done in strategic planning with every company that I ever led was I asked our people to practice the art of possibilities. Think of what could be and imagine if it could be done. So we did that, and we've done it for two and a half years now. And we worked in individual work, workshops with never more than two commissioners, so we didn't break any rules, and we've come up with a great plan. And that plan is one that is not gonna be like the Winnipesaukee Ski Club plan that got usurped by Gunstock coming, the government coming in and usurping what they, what they were able to do. So 
This plan is reasonable, feasible, and defensible. And la the last thing I want to leave you with, it differentiates us from every other ski area in New Hampshire, because there are multiple features about this plan, let alone the uniqueness of the serenity of our environment that we've maintained here, and Greg has helped us do that that are different from others. And differentiation is very important when you compete because we generate every penny of income from people who voluntarily come here for our goods and services and pay out of their earned income. We do not get income from any other source. And we spend that income to operate the, the facility and we save that income to maintain and sustain and develop the facility. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Tom who will have the exciting part of this meeting to show you all the good stuff. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Day. I'm the president and general manager here. Um, I, I wrote a speech. I, I tried to keep it to 45 minutes because <laughs> I know you guys really don't want to see this plan rolled out. Don't touch my hair. Is that what Gary was doing? Yeah. So one of the things that, uh, that Gary was talking about as far as the financial impact, um, we have 48 full-time year-round benefited employees, which 62% of them live in Belknap County, and we employ about 900 seasonal employees, which 64% live in Belknap County. Our, f our annual payroll is about $5.1 million, and $3.2 million of that payroll stays in Belknap County with those people that live here. And as Gary said, there's a huge impact on all the surrounding businesses and all the other things that happen here that is a trickle-down effect from what we do here. So the Master Development Plan, which I'm going to refer to as MDP going forward because saying Master Development Plan over and over again gets a little tough to take. Um, the many projects dis dis uh, discussed in this Master Development Plan represents both short-term and long-term plans for maintaining and upgrading the facilities at Gunstock. There have been many MDPs done every five years since 2000, and many of these pro proposed improvements have been on prior plans. In this MDP, we offer our vision for maintaining the overall facilities at Gunstock while also maintaining Gunstock's appeal to our loyal guests and our competitive standing in the New England ski marketplace. Guests have high expectations for recreational facilities and expect them to be well-maintained and modern. In order to, for Gunstock to remain competitive, and a continuous capital investment in ski improvements, it is essential for attracting and maintaining a loyal customer base. The change is the gun stock. We understand there is always some trepidation when new plans are being introduced. What's going to happen to gun stock? I like it like it is. Believe me, we want to protect and grow the market share in a very competitive New England marketplace, but at the same time preserving the natural beauty and the architectural area that we have here. This has been the discussion since we started working with SE Group that is the appeal of gun stock, and to change that or alter that without a well thought out plan is a big mistake. So let's talk about looking at the reasons for the MDP. Last winter, the banner showed we had the highest ski account, most nice night visits, most season passes sold, and most revenue in the history of the resort. Now there have been some comments that it was because of COVID and everyone was at home. Did that have some effect? Maybe. Somebody calling to tell me to stop talking? Um, so let's look at our preseason sales, see if that has any difference. Our season ticket sales and our each outreach program, which is the, the local school programs that we do, are so significantly far ahead of last year that we stopped selling both of them on November 30th. This has never happened before, and we did that because we were concerned of overcrowding when you add into in our daily tickets. And what we found last year was that by, by controlling our skier volume and sticking with what our comfortable carrying capacity is, which is something we'll talk about later, that we created a better experience for our guests and we also were able to maintain a better margin on our ticket prices. So we made as much money, but we just didn't have the overcrowding situation that people go leave and say, I had a really bad experience there. I waited in line everywhere I went. So we think that's important. So, so fortunately, we are, we are really, you know, we're kicking it right now. And that certainly speaks for expansion. But there are other reasons. Loon just built a brand new eight pack, which is an eight passenger lift. Um, it's, it's very fancy. It costs a lot of money. Uh, it has heated seats in a bubble. So um, I guess you could almost ski in shorts. But um, I, I'm not quite sure we need one of those here. Uh, Waterville Valley will have a six pack by, the, by next winter. 
Bretton Woods built a 16,000 square foot lodge at the top, and then they built a new gondola to reach it, access it. And Mount Sunapee just um, submitted an MDP to build five new chair lifts, two surface lifts, and upgrading their express chair to a six pack. With these improvements, they'll be increasing their comfortable carrying capacity by 40%. Sunapee is a very direct competitor of ours here. And there's lots happening around us. And if you don't keep moving, and you don't keep up with what's happening around you, then you fall behind. And if you fall behind, it's really impossible to catch up. And if you don't catch up, you lose. And if you try to catch up and you try to regain your skier visitation, it's almost impossible to get skiers to come back to your resort if they've gone somewhere else because they've adjusted their habits and they've moved on. The financial reality of the MDP vision, you know, you're gonna see that a lot of these things cost money. While we think it'll be great for Gunstock and the community, the decision to move ahead on any phase will be well thought out. We'll do an ROI, a return on investment, based on the needed increase in skier visitation and a reasonable forecast to carry the debt. By reasonable, I mean creating a forecast that is based on the reality of operating a New England ski area. Those of you that have skied in New England all your life, you understand that we have really good winters, we have good winters, we have kind of iffy conditions where, like last Christmas, it rained three inches. Um, the management staff and the GAC are very conscious of the magnitude of our fiscal responsibility here, and we would not move ahead with these proposed expansions without totally understanding how we're going to be able to pay for them. And as we present this MDP, I want you to keep one thing in mind. These are proposed expansion plans. It's a long-term project and a long-term investment, but it helps with the vision for the future for us. And for the time to act on that vision for the future is really now. We need to, we need to keep going and keep, catch up. So with those comments, I'm going to introduce Claire Humber. And Claire is a principal of the SE Group and Director of Resort Planning. I've worked with Claire for many years. Um, we've been working a lot together to bring this to fruition. And she uh, understands the market, and she understands what a ski area should look like that keeps the, the um, character that, that Gunstock has in place. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. So, Gary, you got it wrong. I get to talk about the fun stuff, not Tom. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks for all coming out this afternoon. Uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, my name is Claire. I am the director of resort planning with a company called SE Group, uh, which was founded in New Hampshire in 1958. Uh, one of the one of the first companies. Uh, in the world to focus on the planning and design of ski areas. Um, we are now 60, almost 64 years young. Uh, we have worked um, all over the world where there are mountains. We've done a tremendous amount of work uh, in New Hampshire. And most importantly, we've been part of your team since this planning endeavor started uh, in 1999-2000. Um, we have worked on the, all of the master development plans, the MDPs, um, with the team, spent a lot of time with Greg over the years doing that, and, and now with Tom. So we're we're happy to be back, uh, and happy to be seeing what has happened here since we started working with you guys in 1999. It's it's been a lot. Um, before I get started, we're going to go back to school. Um, there's Tom has already floated around the notion of comfortable carrying capacity. There's been conversations about skier visitation. So I just want to define a couple of metrics that we use in the world of mountain planning a lot so that everybody can kind of follow along as, as we go. The first is comfortable carrying capacity. We like to call it CCC, which is inappropriate as we're in a CCC building, not the same CCC. Um, this is a number that defines the daily visitors that can comfortably be accommodated at one time without overburdening the infrastructure. It's not the day where you can't find a parking spot and you wait 25 minutes to get on a lift and there's nowhere to sit and you're sitting outside the bathrooms. It's not the crazy busy day. We see over and over again, it's about the 10th busiest day of the year. It's not a, day, it's not a cap on visitation, it's a planning parameter. And it's the single most important mountain planning criteria for a ski area. It's what we balance all other service facilities too. It's how we understand whether there's a need for growth. Um, the subtext there is if you exceed your CCC too many times, 
people get tired of it. People get tired of being treated poorly because they can't get on a lift, they can't find a seat, they can't find a parking spot. That's a good indication of time to grow because you don't want to lose those people. If they go somewhere else, like as Tom pointed out, they, it's very hard to get them back. So that's a, a really important standard for us to understand for growth and also for balancing all the facilities. It's a factor of uh, vertical supply, vertical demand. What do I need by that? Vertical supply is the, we like to call it vertical transport feed. It's the, the amount of lift power going up the hill. And then vertical demand is the demand for that um, coming down the hill, so the number of runs. So keep in mind, so comfortable carrying capacity, the thing to remember, not a cap, design standard, um, and it's sort of a factor, begins with a factor of lifts and terrain, but is important to understand in the context of guest services and parking as well. The second concept is utilization, and that's the percentage of the total potential visitation, so your capacity times the number of days open, that's your potential, right? But that's achieved through your actual visitation. You're not at capacity every single day of the winter. And this is measured against um, daily capacity, CCC, and also the length of the season. So your utilization is a percentage that's the actual visitation, so how many, throughout, how many people come here throughout the entire winter, uh, divided by capacity in the days open. So gun stocks utilization right now is about 38%. So the, the numbers here, you can see um, your total CCC right now is 3760, and this is, I'm sure everyone's like, oh, I know there's 500, there's days when there's 5,000 people here. It's like, yeah, that's a peak day. And again, don't want to do that too many times, or if you do that too many times, it's a really good indication for growth. Now, just to root that in sort of typicals, a typical day use area is around between 25, 35%. That varies hugely. And right away, you say, well, wait a minute, we're at 38, then we must be rock stars. Well, in a way, yes, but you also have night skiing, so that's going to skew that up a little bit. And then destination resorts get higher, and the reason for that is if you have beds at the base of the mountain, the goal is always to fill those beds every day of the week. You get higher midweek visitation as a result of that. Your utilization goes up. Okay, school's over. <laughs> you all did very well. There'll be a quiz at the end. Um, now, the reason why I gave you that, that lesson is you're going to see this list of information on every slide we go through. And some of those, you can see utilization, you can see capacity. The skier visits with the existing resort is a known, but as we move forward, we'll be able to project that because we understand what the capacity is, we understand what the utilization is, remember the math, we can work out what the projection will be for skier visitation. So this is gun stock today. Um, I'm pretty sure I probably don't have to explain your resort to you, but just to orient you a little bit, um, we've got Panorama. You know, we're right here in the main lodge. You've got the sort of guest services happening down here, the main parking lot. Panorama again, Ramrod Tiger, Penny Patu, Penny Patu, <laughs> good to see you, and Pistol. Um, you also have a great complex of, of Nordic trails. You've got the campground, you've got the old ski jumps, um, and then summer, you've got this fantastic zip tour, which I have had the pleasure of riding. I have to say it was a very cloudy day, though, so I didn't get that fantastic view that you get of Mount Washington. You've got the ATA, the um, Aerial Treetop Adventure Course, um, and you've got the Alpine Coaster coming up in here. So great Four Season Resort. This is. I have worked at a lot of ski areas. This is a really magical property you guys have here. It really is. The fact that you have such a large amount of land at the bottom of the mountain, the fact that you have the campground, the Nordic trails, um, you know, it's the views you have from the top of the mountain. And from a four season perspective, this sounds so obvious, but I, I know when we did the 2010 plan, started to think about summer operations, you are the vertical of the lakes region which is an amazing resource where, you know, it's all about the water until you're tired of the water or it's a rainy day or you want to do something different, you are the vertical of the, of the lakes region. So that's a tremendous opportunity. The statistics, just really quickly, um, about 227 acres, 48 trails, uh, 550,000 square feet of guest services space, 
around 1,600 parking spaces, comfortable carrying capacity of 3,760, utilization of 38%, and then the skier visitation number, that 172,000, that's an average from the last five years, but it's actually a four-year average because we threw out the COVID year because of having to close early, so it's kind of a misrepresentation. So what do we know about this existing mountain? You guys know a lot about this existing mountain, right? A uh, couple of things that we look at when we analyze the existing conditions. You know, one, um, you know, because of the panorama quad, it's very, very classic when you have a detachable lift, everybody wants to ride the detachable lift. You go to the fixed grip lifts and there's never a lineup, there's always a big lineup on, on the panorama lift. And one thing that that does is it sort of skews the skiing over onto this side of the mountain because fewer people want to go over here. Which points me to another challenge. I don't know very many areas that have such a long base area, right? The distance between Tiger and Panorama, or if you really want to say pistol, I mean, that's enormous. Skiing back and forth against the bottom of your mountain is really tricky, right? It's really complicated. Um, guest service space, it doesn't take a super busy day to not be able to find a seat here, right? It's, uh, you know, you, it's struggled for years trying to get more, more seats. Um, parking is, is really an issue on busy days, partly because you have this great tubing operation. The challenge with that is the tubers are coming and going every two hours, so there's more parking required for that. Um, there's new parking that's just been completed, right? 200 extra spaces on Breezy Knoll, so that's gonna help that condition. Um, there's been some fantastic renovations to the Stockade Lodge this summer. And you may have noticed there's a new building at the end of the guest services building to get those rentals out of the basement. Probably doesn't bother any of you guys that are, because you're the converted, right? You've already got your skis, but if I'm a new skier, I come to Gunstock, the first thing you do is take me down to the basement, give me a couple of two by fours and tell me to walk up a pair of stairs with some concrete boots on my feet. <laughs> Not a great experience for someone who's learning how to ski. Tom, tell us what else bothers you about your mountain right now. Well, I think all of you guys that ski here know, like, like Claire said, that you have such a, a, a long way to go. If you want to ski on the west side of the mountain, which has got great terrain, you've got to get yeah. over to, you, you can ski from the top, oh, but then when no. you ski down, you have to make the decision, do I want to go all the way back over the pan, or do I want to ride Tiger again to go to the top and then choose my route down? Now, not all of us skiers have that much energy that decides we want to skate all the way over there, so we're gonna show a slide that has a, 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 an idea of what we think we can change it. And also the mountain skis a little lopsided because if you look at the pan on a busy day, there's more people from the east side, from the pistol side, you'll see the lines on the pistol side are a lot longer than the lines facing the ramrod side because more people are kind of utilizing that side of the mountain. So you end up with kind of this, this kind of crooked um, disbursement of people that I think that we can solve as if we make a few adjustments. All right, so that leads us to the first round of improvements. We always start with the near term, immediate, what we have now before we start getting into the longer term things, right? So talking about upgrading the existing resort, and again, you know, we've got the statistics we can come back to. The first thing we looked at was the opportunity for a second detachable chairlift replacing Tiger and Ramrod with one lift that basically goes from the bottom of one to the top of the other, right? So that's what this is representing here. So Ramrod is here, Tiger is here, the new lift will split the difference. So you get it closer to, to the base, closer to panorama, and you capture in a, in a more desirable way the whole western side of the mountain. Um, additional points, so that's represented up here with replacing Ramrod Tiger with a detachable quad chairlift. That gives you about four acres of new terrain and one trail because if you're up here, this is the new trail here to get you down another alternative off the top because you always want to balance the number of downhill trails with the capacity coming up, right, or, or that imbalance is, is a, an issue. Um, because of the um, complexion of replacing two lists with one, there's no change in capacity to this, but there's a, a huge improvement in the, in the way the mountain skis and the way the mountain distributes people. So the experience for the people that are here, um, especially on those busier days, uh, will be a lot better. This is, this is I would say, kind of a, a great segue into moving into an expansion because you're, 
you're making sure that you can ski the mountain as best you can before you start looking for additional, additional places to ski. Um, the additional ski or services here represent correcting the current imbalance. So right now, we always use a range, we always use a pretty big range, and the reason for that is square footage is expensive, and you wanna spend a long time being really smart and really careful on what you're building and why, and there's a lot of ways you can skin that cat and a lot of very creative ways you can do it. So that's, you know, this past winter is a great example. He couldn't come in the lodge to eat, enter the food trucks. You know, there's a lot of resorts that are doing food trucks on purpose, not because you can't come into the lodge. It's a great way to feed people without building a lot of space. That's just one of many examples. So as you move forward, or as you start to think about satisfying the customers you have now, there's a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot of very careful conversations that need to happen. That said, there is a slight deficit in the space you have now. So, you know, before we start expanding, we're talking about the need to get some new additional guest service space. There's no change to capacity, so there's there would be no change to skier visitation other than if you were to move the ball on utilization. And Tom, you know, it seems like last year, as as somebody said at the very beginning of this conversation, that you hit a peak last year. You've had some pretty good years. It seems like the the visitation numbers are trending upward. Um, yeah, the average the average five year average, keeping the COVID year out of it because we did close early. But last year we did two hundred three thousand ski visits. So when you look at that one hundred seventy two, that's a little skewed differently because as we start talking about expansion, you're going to see what we need to do for addition, what it allows us to do for additional skier visits, which of course you need to figure out that, that you get those people and they're gonna pay for it. So, so the 203,000 skier visits was, was the most we've ever done. And uh, that's, so it's certainly a little different than the 172 that's being shown right now. Yeah, yeah. From a summer perspective, you guys have a great summer operation. It, it, as you guys know, it's been building over the last, I think, dozen years almost now. Um, to complement that, uh, one thing that's this has been in the plan before, the idea of having some type of mountaintop facility that's a little bigger than the panorama pub that's there right now, at the very least has running water and, and flush toilets perhaps. Um, on mountain lodges, as, as Tom just mentioned, Burton Woods just built one, Killington built one a few years ago. Um, people love being at the top. We as skiers take a, sort of take for granted how amazing it is to get to the top of the mountain and look out. And from a summer perspective, you know, you have 3% of the population in this country skis, but everyone likes to have a summer vacation. So the, the and most of them come to Winnipesaukee. You guys get like 5 million people here, I think, in the summer. So the ability to have more of attraction to get people to the top of the mountain um, along with that, we're proposing a sort of more accessible short hiking loop around the top. Um, you know, people that are used to recreating in mountains uh, think, don't think twice about climbing a mountain and going for a hike. But for a lot of people, that's just too much. But they still want to have an experience, um, an on-mountain experience. So it's sort of shorter, uh, less gradient-challenged um, hike around the top of the mountain so people can sort of really take advantage of the wonderful views and get that on-mountain experience. Um, this is a summit road that would allow access up to the top. Um, the thinking there is, you know, if you are going to have an on-mountain restaurant of some kind that could be a venue for special events, having an alternative to just having the lift access is always desirable. Um, not necessarily for public. It could be, a, you know, an operational thing with a, a bus or you know, some sort of vehicle going up and down the top, but to be able to support that, support that on mountain um, operation is really important. Um, from, the, from the campground perspective, uh, the campground, the hookup sites of the campground and the two cabins you have are the highest demand, uh, biggest revenue drivers in the campground. And so the idea, and this was in the past master plan of getting more hookups, getting more cabins with the campground, uh, one of the things that this road affords is, is the establishment of some on-mountain cabins as well. 
Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term glamping. It's a kind of a mashup of glamorous camping, but rather than just rudimentary tents, they could be small cabins like the ones you have in the base, but giving people a, sort of an on-mountain camping experience um, is part of this master plan also. All right, let's talk expansion. So three ideas. Um, the first, this has been in previous master plans. We call this the east side because it's on the east side. Good name. Um, this would be a second summit lift. So one of the challenges you have here is there's only one way to get to the top. It's the panorama. This provides a second alternative to the top in that you would ride up pistol, ski down, ride up the east side lift. It's a tremendous amount of terrain, an additional 70 acres. Remember, you have 240 something now, so that's a, a really good add. All variety, uh, you know, novice, intermediate, expert terrain, um, about 11 trails. It would increase your capacity by about 1,000 skiers, which, if you were to maintain your utilization, could add just under 50,000 skier visits. So remember, Tom just told us last year you did 203. Oh, <coughs> yes. Right. So that's like 30 above what your what your five-year average is, and this could add 50. So you're you're almost at this point on a good year. So this is this would be a great uh, next step. It's within <coughs> your current boundary. Um, it has been envisioned before. For those of you who have been uh, following the past master planning processes, you've seen this before. And, and also, as Claire said, another route to the top, that's very important. Right now, we have one way to the top on a busy day, whenever that lift stops, and I hear them call lift maintenance. Um, I need the defibrillators out, because that means everybody's spreading out the ramrod, tiger, and pistol, which are fixed grip lifts that don't necessarily have the same uphill capacity as the pan, and also, it doesn't go to the top. So having, by gaining the extra terrain, it's fantastic. Having another route to the top, it's a big deal. Well, and your view from the top is yeah. so spectacular. Um, as we mentioned, you always need to balance, right? It's not just about the lifts and terrain, but there would be a need for guest services. Um, you know, again, the, exactly how much is something that will you know, require a lot of conversations, but in order to stay in balance, and you will also need some additional parking. And you know, sometimes I feel like we shouldn't say parking, we should say transportation, because there's a lot of ways to get people here. Right? You can, even as simple as you can incentivize uh, an increase in average vehicle occupancy so people get, people get rewarded for having more people in their car. That changes the amount of parking you need, um, whether it's shuttles from town, whether it's you know, buses. There's a lot of ways that you can get people here. Um, the, the, the point is, if you're going to have a thousand more people here, you have to get them here, you and in some cases, you have to park them. All right, <clears throat> where are we going to go next? Alpine Ridge. Again, not a new idea, not even a new ski area, right? Alpine Ridge. Um, I don't know the history of it, but it was at one time was a ski area. Um, it has been envisioned in past plans to bring that back. Uh, what's different with this plan is the notion that in order to be able to ski back and forth. You can sort of see across here coming back from Alpine Ridge and coming from Penny Patu. Penny Patu would be realigned and moved further up the hill so that that can happen. So that allows the sort of continuum from the main ski area to Alpine Ridge to be very fluid. Uh, the benefit of Alpine Ridge, one of the benefits of Alpine Ridge is that it already comes with its own parking lot, which is already being used. Uh, but is a long way from the existing facility. So it would really create a secondary, what we would call portal, another little mountain planning 101 for you, portal onto the mountain. Um, it, again, would require some additional guest services. The capacity here, because it would just be a, um, a triple chairlift is all we're envisioning for this area, given the, the sort of smaller size and vertical of it. It's not, it's not as tall as you can see. It's you know, not as tall as your top of your mountain. Um, that would uh, get about 400 more people, um, more spaces, more parking spaces needed, and potentially 18,000, 20,000 more skier visits. And, and for those of you, Russ DeMays is here, he's quite familiar with Alpine Ridge. Um, for those of you guys that, that have, there's some great terrain over there. There's some good skiing over there. There's some steep Advanced stuff. terrain too, Advanced right? Advanced terrain, yeah. yes. 
So, uh, I mean, you know, I've hiked a, a lot of it. Actually, uh, Claire and her group and I have hiked a lot of these trails, looking at a bunch of different stuff. So it's a it's a it's a a quick way to gain some some advanced terrain and also be able to have and it holds snow really well over there. Um, yeah, and it's got a great. You're right. Russ just said it's got a great fall line. It does. So it's an interesting proposition to be able to have that already in our permit. You know that we own that we could do. All right. So area number three. Oh, and I should also say this is also within your current boundary, right? So I don't think this is a surprise. I think this has been creating a lot of conversation lately. The third idea is a new one. And that is to envision something that is beyond your current boundary. So the, the first comment I would make is, this has not been approved to happen, right? This is not part of gun stock right now. So there is a process that will, if, if this area is to be advanced, there's a, a process that needs to go along with that relative to land ownership, relative to conservation areas, um, relative to county, may, maybe even state regulations. So this is not like, oh, this is, this is happening tomorrow. This is a part of the vision, the long-term vision for the area, and it's an opportunity that's being explored. We did present it to the Gunstock Conservation Commission, and they were and they liked it. They were supportive of yeah. it, but there is a couple more uh, folks that we have to go through to get that to fruition. OK. So this is another uh, big pot of skiing. Uh, with quite a lot of vertical, it would be another detachable chairlift. Um, again, about 1,000 additional capacity, uh, 87 or so acres of terrain, eight trails. Um, again, comes along with the need for additional guest services and parking. This is, I'm going to say this twice, that would not occur at the bottom of this lift. Okay, so there's a need for more parking, there's a need <coughs> for guest services. We are well aware that the goal here is not creating another portal onto the mountain. This is an expansion area that would have to be accessed from the existing area. You know, we are very well aware that this is at the end of a very residential road, and it would not be an appropriate place for 1,000 people to driving, drive down a couple of times a day on a Saturday or Sunday. And the way we designed the lift, it's a top drive. So that's where basically in, a, in a, any lift, the noise happens on wherever the drive certainly is, the gearbox, the, the everything that runs everything. So that would be a top drive. So there would be a limited amount of noise. And some of the other questions that we had is about snowmaking. Um, those of you guys that are skiing here now, those new tower guns that we have, the HKD whisper guns, the um, <laughs> decibel effect if, at 150 feet away, you can't hear them. So there would be actually no sound if you're living in, in Guilford Village. You would never hear the snowmaking because anything over 150 feet, you don't hear those guns. That just made Tom's day to be able to talk about snowmaking equipment. Could you tell? <laughs> Look at it out there. It's a beautiful thing. Nothing makes you happier than That's the big right. white whale. <laughs> All right. so. The last part of the long-term vision, and again, this is not, some of this is not a new, has been in past plans. Uh, the, the more general comment uh, or topic is accommodations, and I mentioned a couple of these things already. In the nearer term, the idea of, uh, you know, hookups, uh, more hookups and, oh, did I just get shut down? Nope. thought my time might have been up. Um, <clears throat> some more hookups and cabins down in the campground. Um, and the sort of on-mountain glamping. And then the third idea is um, the addition of a hotel partnership, so an, an actual accommodations here at Gunstock. Um, as I said before, this is not a new idea. Uh, it's not happening tomorrow. There isn't, like, Marriott isn't the next speaker who's going that, to, that's not going to happen <laughs> at this point. Um, there have been a lot of conversations over the years of this being a possibility. Um, and whether or not it is actually feasible given the sort of legislation that protects gun stock, and it is, uh, but it does require a third party partnership to come in and take that project on. There are three sites that we've identified that I'm sure there are more. We looked at a lot more. Um, this is sort of representative. The goal is to do something unique, which is why hotel site number one is, you know, halfway up that east side area. Um, there's an existing 
uh, Nordic Trail right now that goes to about here, and then this would be part of the new Summit Road. This spot, for those of you who spend a lot of time crawling around out here, you know about this view. It's fantastic. There's no other hotel property in this area that has a view of the lake like this, that, that would. It would be, um, it really would be a game changer for the resort. It would offer something very unique, very special, not just as a sort of a ski-oriented winter hotel, but a year-round place. Um, it would, I'm sure it would be very popular for weddings, events, and, and sort of special occasions as well. And as you talk about more skier visits and being able to get the, more, the skier visits here, having a hotel on the mountain, having hot beds on the mountain, that's a big deal because then they're going to come here, they're going to stay here, and they're going to be skiing here. So that, that helps us getting what we call hot beds. Tom, you're like making my mountain planning 101 course need to be longer. So a hot bed, right? So a second home is a cold bed because it's only hot when the owners are there. Whereas a hotel is a hot bed because it's, it's someone sleeping in that bed every night, right? So remember I said with the utilization, destination resorts have higher utilization because of those hot beds and the need to fill them seven days a week. So yeah, the, when I talked about the increased visitation and the increased capacity of the east side, with a hotel property, well, and, and actually with any of these expansions, a hotel property would, would help elevate the visitation um, because of those hot beds. The other two sites, um, the site up here on Breezy Knoll, that's been talked about before too. Um, you know, very proximate to the base area. It is a pretty site. Um, it is a little bit removed from, from the hubbub that is a ski area, base area. Um, the third site hasn't been talked about before. That would be the pistol parking lot area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we were talking about hotel sites, every time we talk about hotel sites in base areas, it's a tough place to put a hospitality operation, right? There's a lot going on in a hotel, in a ski area base. But you guys have such a big base area and going over to the pistol lot, it's so removed over there, um, you know, we think that would be a pretty good spot too if you can't get up on the mountain. But, um, you know, these are numbered intentionally. The, you know, the number one spot is definitely that sweet little spot up on the hill. Okay, so let's roll this up a little bit. You've seen all these numbers before, don't be afraid, a lot of numbers. Uh, but just starting from the left and working right, so you've got the existing resort, right, with that existing capacity of around 3760, and uh, annual visitation on the five-year average around 172. The existing resort upgrades move the needle a little bit as far as terrain, doesn't move the capacity number or the visitation number. But when you start getting into the three expansion areas with east side, you could, with that additional 70 trains, so the, the numbers on the right are the sort of running total, the number of the lifts, the number on the left is what that, that pot of skiing contributes. So east side takes that capacity up to 4,800. Alpine Ridge would take the capacity up to 5,190. The uh, back side would take it up to 6,360. And you can see what the visitation does Again, if the utilization stays the same, which it could get higher if you become, you know, if you do the, get that hotel site going from 172 to 222, 240, 294. Now again, if and when, right? This, when we talk about expansion plans, there's always like, if you hit that next metric of growth, then you contemplate that next move. It's not just, okay, this is gonna happen tomorrow all at once. And I'm, I'm sure Tom has more to say about that. Yeah, and I mean, also, when you're looking at that 172, last year that was a 203. So when you look at the 203 to 222, that's not that big a stretch because you do have to find the skiers to come here. They've got to come from somewhere. So that's not that big a stretch to be able to, to get to that number to do the east side. So you, you have to find the skiers or you have to provide a reason for skiers to come more frequently, right? Right. A skier visit is, is one, one day on the mountain. So it could be several times by one person. Uncle Kurt. I'm not sure you mentioned that the west side is the third way to the top of the mountain. Oh, we didn't. So Gary just brought that up. So the, 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 the west side, the peaks, uh, the backside weeks area, that is also, oh, also way to top, get to access. The top because right. with the upgraded ramrod lift, you will yep. be able to ski down 
to the the All right, so you ride this backside weeks and, and then you come down and then you go up so suddenly, yeah, you know, it's really kind of nice that it creates all these different ways to get to the top. And you get ski all the way around as well. All right. That's your clue. So this is where we're going to talk about what it's going to cost. Um, you can so and the reason why the, so the numbers we're going to talk about are really focused at this point on the lifts, terrain, and snowmaking of the pod. Again, with guest services and parking, you know, what that, the complexion of what that's going to look like requires a lot more sort of due diligence and thinking and, and sort of thriftiness, really. So to, there's, it, would be, it would be unwise for us to start talking numbers at this point on that component. But the more salient points um, right now are the, like, what does it cost to get the skiing established, right? So just basically, you've seen 5.5 million. That's about what a detachable quad lifts cost now in 2021. So um, they're, not, they're not cheap, um, but we think it will make a huge difference on the way that this mountain skis. Yeah, and I think actually that 5.5 million, five of that is the lift. And the 500, because remember, there's very little additional terrain snowmaking needed for that first piece. By contrast, for east side, right, so this is... Uh, Longer lift uh, and quite a bit, 70 acres of, terra of terrain that you have to build and put snow on. And like I said when I was talking, this is a long-term project and a long-term investment. So when you're looking at that number and it seems a little staggering, it kind of depends on what you, what you stretch it out. Do you make, is it a 20-year note that you're paying on it? So when we're looking at how we pay for everything, we look at, as I said before, we project what, our, what we think our skier visits will be, we base it on what I, we know our revenue is, and we base it on how we know that we can comfortably be able to cover whatever we do with a reasonable um, forecast of what we're gonna be able to do. And it's a long-term plan with a long-term investment. And once again, it's proposed expansions. We're not gonna go and do something that we don't think we can pay for. So I want to make sure that everyone in here knows that and everyone that you talk to after this, if we, <laughs> we're gonna make sure that we can pay for this, this expansion and that it can it work for us because we do need to get moving here. We need to, we need to start making some moves and making some expansion and making some noise and getting this, all this terrain that we have skiing better than it is now. And that's a huge opportunity that a lot of other places don't have. Right. Okay, so let's look at the rest of these numbers. So Alpine Ridge, smaller area, right? So less terrain. And then the backside, again, is a, a bigger, bigger uh, pod rather than the 70 acres of east side, that would be 87 plus. So that's a, a bigger price tag. And as Tom pointed out, a lot of that is the lift, lift uh, infrastructure. And these prices are today's prices. That's the other, you know, very big unknown when you start to forecast future expansion. Um, you know, until you're actually ready to go, you're never going to know what that, what that lift is going to cost. And, and something that we need to think about as we're looking at this expansion, and obviously we need the support of the, of the people in the community, is that um, Fail Resorts is bu are buying 17 lifts this year. And so there are no lifts available. So if we need to think about doing this, we need to think about making plans, being able to fiscally responsibly set this up to be able to move on this in a year or so when we can put our order in for our lifts. And one of the reasons that that happens is all of you guys have suffered through the same thing. It's a supply chain issue. So they just can't get the parts that they need to build the lifts. So um, that's something to keep in mind as, we, as the discussion furthers about how we fund this and what we do with it. Perfect. Okay, so um, one, last, uh, one last mountain planning 101, and I think this is probably more of a cautionary tale, and then we'll turn it over to, to questions. Um, just wanted to, we got into this conversation earlier this week, I just wanted to share this with you. This is something that comes up in every project we do, and this is uh, something that we see over the course of our history in this industry that resorts, ski areas that make sequential and serial disciplined capital improvements 
continue to gain or maintain market share. Those that don't, don't. Those that don't fail to remain competitive, which means their visitation drops, which means their net operating income starts to decline, which makes their ability to make any capital improvements or investments impossible. And when they can't make that investment, they will fail. And we see this over and over again. It's the, I'm gonna say it again, <laughs> resorts that sequentially and serially make disciplined capital investments continue to maintain or gain market share. Those that don't, don't. It's that simple. Mic drop. No. <laughs> Thank you.